I'm happy to welcome Per Backlund, who's a professor of uh, informatics and co-founder of the Serious Games Master Program at University of Skövde in uh, Sweden. Uh, he's interested in the development and application of serious games in education, vocational training, traffic education, and rehabilitation. Now, to in, uh, of course, uh, Per will, will guide the topic. I just want to introduce a couple of uh, Wittgensteinian questions here. Wittgen, uh, in his work, uh, Per has mentioned the fact that Wittgenstein particularly chose game as the ambiguous uh, feature of language in general. But uh, one of the things I hope that uh, Per will tell us is what is a game and what is serious? Wittgenstein had great difficulty. In fact, he suggested that it was fundamental in finding what it is that all things have in common that, that uh, merit being called games. That's what led him to his idea that there isn't anything that all games have in common. In fact, there's nothing that the reference of any words have in common. Um, an interesting question at this point is to ask what the relation is between games and designing games and sports because sport is also a difficult thing to define. It's, all, it's an artifact, it's a kind of thing that humans do uh, with other kinds of categories. We determine what their features are, what their distinguishing features are objectively. I always use the example of mushrooms. I mean, it's not up to human beings to decide which mushrooms are, for, are safe for them to eat and which ones are not safe for them to eat. This is called supervised learning. If you eat something and it makes you sick, probably you should stop eating it. The criterion is outside of the uh, categorizer. But in the case of games, we are the criterion. We, de we decide what we consider to be a game. Uh, things like virtual reality come to mind as well. So I'm wondering to what extent these general considerations will arise in the, uh, there will no doubt be in Pear's talk, focus questions about how to actually go ahead and having settled what a serious game is, how to go about designing them. Pear. I pass it to you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to this seminar series. I'm uh, honored to participate. Um, so just a few words. My, uh, my background is in a more traditional type of informatics, business informatics, information systems and such. Um, but I switched interest and I have been an active researcher in serious games since uh, 2005, uh, when I started with a couple of colleagues to build research around computer games in general and serious games in, in particular at uh, our university. So my specific focus and interest is on organizational implementation and usefulness of games and that I guess comes a bit with my background in uh, informatics uh, so I'm not uh, um, a good game designer per se uh, I'm more on the other side of serious games so I'll come back to that I guess uh, and uh, uh, apart from doing research projects I'm also uh, the administrator and a teacher in one of our master programs, uh, which is focusing on serious games. A uh, few words about my place. Uh, I'm located in the west of Sweden. Uh, if you know anything about Sweden, we are quite close to the second biggest city, Gothenburg. Uh, we're a small place, small university, but we're actually the biggest academic educator in computer games in Sweden. And uh, with that also, we do quite a fair share of research uh, coming with that. Uh, we have been doing this uh, for almost 20 years now. In fact, we started our first uh, bachelor program in game development in 2002. Then we admitted 30 students studying uh, some sort of combination of game design and programming. Uh, it uh, soon became very successful, uh, and uh, since then we have uh, uh, expanded a lot on that. 
So now we do have a strong focus on game development uh, on our school, the School of Informatics. We have, uh, I don't know, 500, 600 students uh, studying game development in total. And that includes actually a variety of competences, everything from programming, uh, game design, to the more artistic side, such as uh, 2D graphics, 3D graphics, game writing, uh, sound and music. Uh, and uh, we also run four study programs on advanced level with different specializations. And uh, if you're enrolled in our PhD school, you can also focus on games. For, for that topic. Um, yeah, I, moving on then to the reason that I was invited, I, I actually kind of regret it now after your introduction that I removed the, the uh, one or two slides about uh, definitions of games. So I did that deliberately because I thought that I would move to the area which is uh, closer to me and closer to what I do. Uh, so, as I said, we started early with education in uh, games. And uh, we soon, myself and a few colleagues, we soon got a strategic mission to build research uh, relating to games. And at the time, when we started to look for funding, it turned out that it was much easier to get funding for serious games projects. That is, the question was always, okay, games, interesting, but uh, what are they good for? What are they useful for? What can you use them for? And that led us to much work in serious games area. Um, and um, since we wanted to have games and game development as a starting point, we, we ended up with it pretty open uh, and inclusive view of what we think serious games are, as you can see on this slide. So it pretty much includes all sorts of applications of games or game technology or game thinking, um, uh, if you want to use it for an additional, uh, typically a non-entertainment purpose. Um, and uh, we have kind of stuck to that uh, since then. Uh, and it has served us well because we um, can use it to convince the uh, management and university of certain things that are useful for us. So we didn't really put much more attention to that in, in that sense, in the more uh, philosophical sense of games, we rather moved quite quickly on to the practical applications and the practical development of games and such. Uh, so as I said, my background is in more traditional IS. And as you may be aware of, there is a rich body of knowledge addressing the development of that class of systems, information systems development, different types of utility systems for organizational effectiveness on all sorts of levels. Um, and some of the keywords that I just wanted to point to there that we, we typically think of IT based system, even though obviously they don't have to be. Uh, we think that utility and organizational value is, of course, an uh, important thing. Uh, and uh, we also like to stress the human in the loop that uh, humans are parts of these systems. H humans are the users of these kinds of IT systems. So with that background, uh, it seemed reasonable for me to uh, look at serious games as well when I was approached with, with that opportunity from colleagues working in games. Um, so I guess that what we think of when we say serious games may be illustrated like this. We think of um, games as solutions to some organizational problem. Uh, and my interpretation and uh, definitely the 
interpretation of many of my colleagues is that we seem to lean too much towards the serious part rather than the game part. So meaning that serious games are possibly too serious. Um, also, from my background in, in information systems, uh, um, I would like to point to one of the well-known scholars there, uh, Johanny Ivari from Finland, uh, who has spent a lot of work together with several colleagues to uh, think of what is the body of knowledge for information systems development? What do you need to know and understand to develop information systems? So he concluded in this figure in one of his papers, the IS body of knowledge, uh, that uh, there are different ontological domains, knowledge domains uh, that you need to cover. So the domain of IF, IS development processes, that is uh, how do you develop this class of systems? What are the tools, the techniques, the methods and approaches that you use? And that one is classified as one of the core competence areas for IS developers. Uh, it's talking about the IS application knowledge, which is associated with the kind of typical IT applications and their use in a given domain, uh, which is also by Ivari uh, classified as a core competence. Then you have the application domain knowledge, which is uh, associated with uh, the domain for which the system is built. And this is uh, uh, information and knowledge that is most likely to reside with also the domain experts working in the domain. And um, uh, it has to be uh, absorbed into the development process somehow for an IS system. And technology knowledge associated with the typical types of hardware and software and how they may be applied uh, to those different applications domain, application domains. And that's of course computers and operating systems and whatnot. And then all is in set in an organizational setting, an organizational knowledge which is associated with all the social and economic processes of an organization in which the system is used. Uh, so this also includes the humans and the different stakeholders, typically referred to as uh, users or developers or managers or so. Uh, but <clears throat> a game is a game in our view. And then some other characteristics come into play. If you look at the work of scholars like Johan Holtzinga or Calois, uh, you rather see descriptions like this, that um, a game is a voluntary and enjoyable activity. It's somehow separate from the real world. It's unproductive in the sense that it should not produce any goods or external value. It's an important part of human culture important social function um, and above all uh, it's a meaningful activity in its own right uh, and maybe better illustrated like this but then what is a serious game <clears throat> when we try to combine these two spheres and um, that is um, what I am particularly interested in and what we have been particularly interested in in our work in the area of serious games. What happens when you introduce and combine these two spheres, the utility, productivity sphere and games? Is there a conflict between the unproductiveness and uh, enjoyability and vol voluntariness uh, as opposed to serious games, which are more about effectiveness and usefulness, and in some cases to improve productivity. Uh, and yeah, of course, uh, 
productivity and well the utility aspect is important uh, because that would be the whole point of <coughs> having a serious game but it also is implied that if you introduce the notion of games into the productivity sphere something else happens um, so this is the things that we want to explore and we have done that with a quite strong focus on uh, design science research. So we have tried to find problems that are relevant to businesses or organizations. And we have been very interested in building artifacts, serious games, and in testing them in real context. So we've been, uh, we've paid much uh, effort into moving into the places where the games are actually used with the real users. Uh, so along with that, we have also strived to take game development as a starting point when doing that. And much like IS development, game development is multidisciplinary in itself. And you can see that from the uh, uh, games research landscape, which clearly reflects this um, uh, multidisciplinarity. Uh, and in fact, several scholars in the area point to the necessity of interdisciplinarity or, or multidisciplinarity to um, have any deeper understanding of games, of digital games. So in that sense, some people say, yes, digital games are software products. And sure, aspects of game development and game development processes have been somewhat addressed in, in the IS community, for example, when viewed as a software product. Uh, but uh, we also feel very strongly that a game is, a digital game is not only a software product, it's so much more. And it seems hard to capture all these aspects within a single topic, uh, and especially within a single topic oriented only towards uh, technology. So this means that there are several creative aspects of game development that somehow complicate the development process and may be illustrated like this, um, that apart from the type of developers that you would expect in any IT uh, project, you also have the aspect of artists and creative expression when it comes to games in the form of uh, audio designers, art, writing. Um, this is uh, all about creating the experience, the play experience, the game play experience of games rather than gearing towards productivity. And that role is uh, quite often in, in game development projects projects held by a producer. Uh, so maybe that is partly borrowed from film industry in that sense. Uh, but um, I have a question for you, Pierre. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. In this, in this uh, community that, that you describe, or the, in this population that you describe of mm -hmm. contributors on this page, what seems to be missing is uh, the users and their cognition. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll come to that, I guess. Uh, thank you for pointing it out. We, uh, so when we have looked at this, we have, we're missing some things. Uh, we miss uh, game design knowledge in the IS sphere, as you may remember from the Ivari uh, conceptualization. Uh, that was not included. Uh, and um, we also have an other view of the users. We typically refer to them as players with different expectations. And in serious games, of course, the users are potentially players and users in, in that sense that if they use the serious game for a purpose uh, that should be uh, another perception of of uh, the users. So I hope that uh, uh, kind of answered 
Not it does. Much. It does, but it raised a question from Cédric Félicite. Yeah, yeah, John. Yeah, hi, I'm Cédric Félicite uh, from Solution Brainiac. Uh, sorry yeah. for the the sound dying. Uh, I I would like to know in serious game. I think the experience from the producer it means uh, the experience in education and uh, training. He needs yeah. to have uh, some. Uh, some experience in in, uh, in teaching, uh, in uh, educational uh, learning. Mm, yeah, I think I heard you. I had some problems hearing you. There was uh, some noise in the background, but I think the question was uh, uh, the role of the producer and the role of the producer in a serious, serious games project. So um, we haven't really seen the role of the producer in serious games product so far. We think that that is something that we are exploring and maybe one of the potential roles of uh, people who graduate from our serious games study program because they uh, get that kind of knowledge uh, from the courses they take. What uh, are the additional requirements um, uh, on someone who wants to uh, develop serious games? What does this combination of game design knowledge and other types of uh, competences needed for the serious applications? So I hope that answered the question. So I think yeah. that the producer could it would be a key role uh, and the new kind of producer for serious games, I think. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I was thinking to make uh, to to make some producer back from the uh, learning field mm -hmm. and uh, mix them with a uh, video game developer. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that that I mean educational games that is a huge um, part of the serious games area. I think that educational games, game-based learning and such is probably the biggest application area of serious games, maybe along with games for health um, uh, also. So for sure, I think, and I think there is actually quite much research on educational games and educational game development that you can uh, read up on. So, so I definitely think that you will need some knowledge also in, in pedagogy or and above all also I think that has been our experience in the projects where we have been working with schools and school children that you need an understanding for uh, the learning context of uh, the players uh, whether it's played in school or at home uh, has some meaning and of course uh, the um, pedagogical presentation of the content. So there is a, a rich body of knowledge. I think that uh, uh, Catherine Becker wrote a very good book on that, uh, about how to use, educate, develop and use educational games. So, hmm. And we have another comment from Jonas Collin. Okay, so my question would be, uh, in recent organizations where we're seeing uh, a uh, pretty important, significant place given to uh, internal players or IE testers. Uh, what, how do you see internal testers in your game developer organization, uh, specifically uh, based on recent organization orientation where testers, players are becoming uh, more and more important, uh, just actually to determine the experience, as you said it, uh, uh, which is kind of the role of the producer here. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, as you point out, that's challenging. And, and generally, in all our teaching and game development, we encourage uh, iterative development and continuous testing, and continuous testing even of early, very crude prototypes, even paper prototypes, to try and capture those uh, aspects. In serious games, uh, and I'll come back to that particular thing in one of the examples that I will share later on. But in serious games, we have also approached that 
by including, of course, the uh, tester on or, or the testing on the target audience with respect to the effect and usefulness, for example, of the game as well. So not only then the gameplay experience, but also the utility. So that is how we try to address it. But iterative development and continuous testing, that is what we strongly advocate in all our uh, study programs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so then moving back to the Ivari picture, then with this as a backdrop, we feel of course strongly that uh, there is something missing. Uh, I mean, we believe that the, the marriage that is, has been proposed by game and utility is not at all that straightforward as sometimes um, uh, described, that the, uh, we often feel that the game design knowledge has not been enough appreciated and acknowledged in the IS community part of serious games, that serious games have been much more viewed as an IS product, um, so something missing. And uh, we introduced them to uh, this picture, the game development domain as that part being missing, um, including then, of course, the uh, view of the users. So, Users become users, players, IS developers. Well, we introduce several new competences uh, into those teams. So this becomes a new mix. And uh, in the following, I would like to just briefly share and discuss some of the challenges that we have been working with pertaining to this balance between game and utility and how we have try to balance it in our different projects. Uh, and I'm starting with one of our early projects, uh, one of the first two or three projects that we did, in fact. And uh, this was a project uh, we, uh, called Elinor, uh, which was about stroke rehabilitation. And we did that together with um, uh, our regional uh, hospital, the Neuro Neurology Rehabilitation Unit, and together with uh, researchers from uh, neuroscience in um, Salgrenska Academy in Göteborg. Um, so the goal of this project was to deliver home-based stroke rehabilitation for non-typical gamers. That was like the project vision. And um, the result was the uh, console that you can see in the picture, a, a brand new game console with a, a physical uh, interaction uh, and uh, specifically designed or adapted games for that console and for the target audience. So all packed and shipped in a separate console like this. In fact, that idea was uh, uh, based on, uh, you know, game cabinets in the 70s, which, you, you know, you, there's one button, you do one thing and that's it. Um, so stroke rehabilitation, uh, back to then that we wanted to move into areas where we felt that there was actually a need it seemed and we learned that uh, stroke is a quite common problem and that the chance of surviving if you're in the Western hemisphere is quite high. And then there is a big need for rehabilitation. And what we learned from our friends at the hospital is that the motivation and interest for rehabilitation drops significantly already after a week or two. And this is of course very problematic because they know that rehabilitation pays off for months or even years after the stroke. So that is the kind of problem that they approached us with. Uh, so this project, we spent around eight months of production time. So that included hardware and game development. 
uh, and also a pre-evaluation. Uh, and that pre-evaluation was done with nursing students. And that is a little bit of your uh, question, Jonas, that we did not have access to patients to test during development to the extent needed. So we thought that, well, nursing students could be one target group to, to capture some aspects. And of course, we tested with uh, professionals uh, in the development team. Um, the actual development process uh, utilized a, a rapid prototyping approach where we did several versions of both hardware and software, uh, which were continually tested with um, both professionals and some selected patients who were involved in the um, uh, development process. And those were relatively healthy patients. Uh, so that iterated and uh, the final result you saw was the cabinet, but for sure the first versions of the things that we tested did not at all look like that. And we tried to focus much on interactions uh, and on what kind of games that people would possibly approach it, uh, appreciate. And during this work, we came to realize that it's actually quite hard to talk about uh, games, game design and what are games with non-designers or people who are really not that interested or have um, uh, some background in it. There is a lack of a common language for that. So we came across uh, uh, Stefan Björk. Uh, he's a game scholar uh, who formed a game design pattern language uh, for, for game design, which we were quite in inspired by and that helped us to think in new ways on how to talk about uh, game design with non-experts so we had some inspiration from that but it was for sure much about showing testing uh, and redoing um, the uh, evaluation should be done in a natural environment. That was definitely our goal. And at the time, that was actually a pretty unique uh, setup because most of the things that we saw when it came to stroke rehabilitation with games were not at all tested in, in natural environments. Um, and uh, especially not at home, in the homes of patients. So that was an important uh, factor for us. And in total, we had 16 participants participating during two five week sessions. Uh, so they were organized like this that uh, there was a screening test done by the physiotherapist and occupation, occupational therapists, as an interview by a psychologist. Uh, and um, then we delivered the Eleanor machine to the homes of the participants and from our side not much more than that because one of the things that we wanted to see was whether it actually worked to just deliver it and see if people understood what they could do and then there was a process yeah, of, i have uh, to interrupt you again i'm sorry uh, when you started mentioning the re rehabilitation you showed an illustration but you didn't explain what was going on up there and uh, let me say as a <clears throat> semi-neuropsychologist, I want to know what uh, handicaps after a stroke are mm -hmm. that you are trying to fix, because this is all too vague and methodological yeah. until we have a concrete idea of what you're yeah. trying to fix. Yeah. So, so the uh, target was upper extremity rehabilitation, uh, hands and arms. Uh, so we did not at all go for uh, the cognitive aspects uh, which would also have been, uh, of course, very interesting given the fact of games. But together with the uh, rehabilitation people, we decided to go for um, arm rehabilitation and the selection of 
patients to participate were then people who uh, had suffered a stroke uh, that came also with uh, left or right hand impairment. And what movements in particular? Yeah, so that would be then uh, uh, movements, left, right, up, down, these kinds of movements with the whole arm. Some focus on uh, grip also. Um, so we used uh, something called the ARAT test. Uh, that was from the occupational ter therapists to determine the rehabilitation effect. So that is uh, things like movement and grip. Okay, that helps. Now we have mm -hmm. something concrete in our minds as you speak yeah. about the methodology. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, good that you pointed out. I forget I should have uh, included some some more detail on that in in one of the previous slides. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then uh, there was a post test and. Uh, uh, a follow-up interview to see what um, what had happened. Um, the aspects that we tried to evaluate was, of course, we were very interested in gaming behavior. And for that, we thought that, well, time and maybe impressions of flow experience could be useful. So we used playtime as uh, one way of trying to measure the interest. We delivered the, the machines without any particular in, uh, instructions on how much to play or what to do with them. Our hope was that if people play for 10, 15 minutes per day, maybe five days a week or something, so roughly an hour a week, that would be a good result. Uh, but when we looked at the game logs, that was actually exceeded by far. So I think uh, the, the playtime was five to six times higher than we expected. And in fact, the most common complaint was lack of content. Uh, and we also found when we talked to patients that they talked about their play experience and they had statements uh, indicating flow experiences and things like that, that was actually shared with the way that gamers talk about their play experience. So we could definitely see that we um, uh, got to the, um, that part of the game where, where they felt that, yes, we, we actually, we enjoy this. We, play it not because we are doing rehabilitation, but because we want to play because it's fun. Um, of course, we wanted to look at rehabilitation effect as already indicated. And for that, we uh, used the uh, action research arm test. That's an ARAT test, which is like a standardized test for uh, assessing upper extremity disability. Um, which comes from the uh, area of occupational therapy and physiotherapy. So that is the kind of measures we move, uh, looked at. And the results were positive that they showed a significant improvement in the um, function between the uh, baseline test, the first test and the post test. And even in the follow-up test, which was made four months after uh, the baseline test. So that was uh, uh, very positive. Uh, and in terms of user acceptance, of course, a system like this has to be acceptable for patients as well as professionals. And uh, it landed well. Uh, the healthcare professionals felt that this could probably be a useful tool. They particularly liked the idea of designing a rehabilitation process around it and the, the possibility to do follow-ups by means of uh, inspection of logs and things like that. Uh, and patients, there was also a quite high user acceptance among them. And we used an adapted version of the technology acceptance model, model to determine that. Uh, so to sum up, I think, uh, we, there was at the time many claims concerning game-based rehabilitation in the home, but surprisingly very little empirical evaluation, and we contributed to do that. 
uh, I think we identify a sort of a mid range segment here. Uh, not high-end systems, which were quite popular we were, uh, with the other colleagues that we were working with, which were typically installed at rehabilitation units, but far too expensive and far too complex to use in the home. Then there was a stream towards using commercial games, uh, because this was also at the time when physical interfaces started to appear with games like the, the um, Wii, for example. Um, but what we found that those games, they were too far, too hard, far too hard in several aspects, not only the games themselves, but also the general setup of the console. We had a, a vision which we called instant fun, meaning that you should only push a button and then 30 seconds later, you should be in the gaming. But that was not at all the case with the Wii console at the time. Uh, so, the second product I would like to share has a very different character, even though still in the healthcare sector, this was about medical simulation and training, and we were working together with the regional ambulance unit uh, and uh, pre-hospital researchers. And the vision and the goal here in this product was to develop uh, similar to training environment to improve the uh, role play training that was typically used in uh, uh, in the ambulance unit. Uh, so traditional medical simulation uh, focus on the medical scenario, which makes sense, of course, and they use uh, these kinds of advanced mannequins uh, to uh, uh, to train that. Uh, but the training facility uh, uh, that they wanted should cater for also the fact that pre-hospital medicine or pre-hospital care takes care in takes place in very many different places and contexts. So pre-hospital medical care is something different. And uh, we did that together them, with them and we installed the whole solution at the ambulance unit. So that includes uh, the plug and play driving simulator to capture the transportation aspect. It included uh, an adaptable scene room, which was a rebuilt conference room to cater for different scenarios. Uh, for example, in workplaces or uh, a workshop or in the home of a patient, you could uh, um, do different setups quickly with the help of um, uh, um, projectors and sound and some simple props. Uh, and then, of course, the patient at the center of the uh, scenario, because the patient is what, what is important, of course, in the uh, caretaking process. But for that, we used the same mannequins that they normally use for training. Uh, so the pre-hospital process actually starts even, uh, even though we don't really think of it already when you uh, call for assistance and you end up with the uh, alarm unit. Um, and it ends possibly uh, when uh, the patient is handed off at the hospital. Uh, so how can you capture this whole process in a training scenario? Uh, and that is uh, something that they struggled much with. Uh, so we uh, termed our concept contextualization, meaning that uh, we wanted to capture the whole process but in an easy and flexible manner. So the scenario starts with the turnout and then you are in the plug and play driving simulator and you start the communication with the alarm unit and you get some information so that you can get into the uh, planning process for what happens when you enter the patient's home, which is here. Uh, and uh, uh, what you should 
do there, what kind of information is available apart from the medical information from the mannequin. And then the uh, loading and handing over at the ER unit. So we wanted to capture the whole process. Um, and um, when we designed the system and uh, um, evaluated it, we uh, worked with the concept of immersion in serious games to explore uh, what happens when people get very much engaged into the, the role play experience. So we borrowed the concept of immersion, which is quite popular in the game design uh, community, uh, which says something about the extent to which you get invested in a game. It's sort of similar to flow, but uh, normally people talk about scales from high to low immersion, and it's typically measured through questionnaires. Uh, and high immersion is seen as a positive quality of uh, games, uh, since uh, one of the reasons to stay in a game is uh, motivation, immersion. Uh, so the, the likelihood to stay on the task for longer would increase. Um, so when we modeled this, it rather looked like this. Um, the uh, medical treatment scenario includes treatment, caretaking, communication, and transport. And it is done in different places, the scene of the accident, the ambulance at the hospital. So we tried to uh, go beyond the traditional way of doing this in medical simulation, which is the left picture. And that is that the instructor is, instructor is in the uh, scenario together with the participants. And, simply giving instructions. Okay, now you are there and there, and this and this has happened. And here is your patient. Please go ahead and inspect the patient. Um, whereas we felt that adding more of the complexity to the scenario that is relevant to the pre-hospital staff would make sense. And we turned that the contextualized scenario. So we included, uh, information that comes from the scenario. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of information that is represented in the context. When you come to a scene of an accident, uh, for example, sign of drug use uh, can be information that is uh, adding to the interpretation of a symptom. So that is, for example, possible to determine if you are in a certain place, you may find some other things that would shed some additional light to the uh, treatment. Um, and uh, we designed two medical scenarios, which were then distributed under traditional and contextualized scenario. And then we had 12 professional ambulance teams uh, who tested them to see how they reacted to the two versions. Did they become more immersed in the live role-playing activity with our solution than with the traditional one? Uh, and uh, in fact, we could see that uh, the immersion was higher in the contextualized version of the medical scenario. We moved from only doing questionnaires to designing uh, together with the, the um, uh, pre-hospital care experts, uh, an observational uh, tool to determine the um, uh, level of immersion where we looked for certain types of interactions. Uh, that is how you interacted with this mannequin, uh, which would be indicators or triggers of higher and lower immersion. Uh, and uh, we could see that the immersion was actually uh, higher in the contextualized scenario. Uh, 
Then we also uh, uh, did a follow-up study where we looked at performance. And again, we used the standardized performance tool uh, among uh, pre-hospital researchers uh, where we had um, independent experts inspecting the videos of these scenarios um, to see um, what they thought about or ask them to judge the performance of the teams. And then it turned out that the teams performed better, uh, especially for the overall clinical performance and situation awareness, which are two important components of uh, uh, this evaluation uh, tool. Uh, within the contextualized scenarios. And uh, the latter, the situation awareness is one of the things that they pointed out, out to us is especially important in pre-hospital care. Uh, so that was, that's all good. But when we got back to reading about uh, other aspects of game-based training and game-based learning, we saw that immersion is actually sort of a double-edged sword. It can sometimes be detriment to learning because learning requires uh, reflection uh, and the lack of reflection needed to be solved. Uh, and that's a, a conflict in the sense that reflection is an immersion breaker, uh, which may be problematic uh, from a gameplay perspective. So they don't necessarily go hand in hand. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a question related to this from Maul, yeah. which is, would immersion be dis detached from flow if we factor in growth from the player's perspective? I suppose what she means by growth is what they learn from the exercise. Yeah, yeah. To, my interpretation is that flow is typically perceived as a positive experience, that you're in the flow, you're in the zone. Uh, whereas immersion, as, at least as it's used in, the, in much of the game development community, is uh, rather a, a, a matter of level of immersion. So you can be uh, little immersed or more. Uh, that would be the main difference. But for sure, the immersion concept uh, and the gameplay immersion concept has borrowed a lot from flow theory, for sure. And of course, it's a drawback that we typically measure it by either questionnaires or, in our case, by observation and uh, questionnaires and interviews. But we have done some experiments with uh, uh, trying to capture psychophysiological signals as well to see if you can know something about the immersiveness of the uh, or the immersion of the player, but um, hmm. Noel followed up with the question: It's you seem to be treating flow as all or none, and you seem to be treating immersion as a matter of degree. But isn't there a matter of degree in flow? Yeah, I would imagine, uh, and uh, we have struggled with this. Uh, and as I said. Um, they are probably similar, uh, but my interpretation again of flow is that it's definitely a positive experience uh, and uh, of being in the zone. Uh, so you're sort of either in the zone or not, whereas immersion is more of a graded thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just a, a passing remark. I haven't heard anything about psychologists being involved in any of this? Is it all done by technical people and domain no, experts? Have, uh, uh, one of the colleagues is a cognitive scientist. Uh, um, and uh, in, in the particular case, case of the ambulance, uh, we have psychologists working with us in the Eleanor project. But in this project, we uh, the team was ourselves and a cognitive scientist. Well, cognitive scientist is rather general, but okay, I'll yeah, take that yeah. and say yes. But with with uh, with a particular interest in in uh, cognitive psychology, I'd say so. Uh, not the strongest part of the development team, but absolutely represented. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
So one, one of the things that we actually found and that I think is an interesting takeaway is that uh, this idea of trying to contextualize the scenarios to cater for the whole process rather than only parts of it as traditionally actually turned out to be quite useful because we had several and, and also the the part where we developed um, um, uh, after support that is technical system support for after action review. Uh, we had several uh, instructors describing training situations where critical decisions uh, were discussed and it turned out that the participants and the instruction instructor did not at all uh, agree on what actually happened. And especially in the traditional way of training, uh, the participants will have to say that, okay, we're done. Whereas we aim for that, do as you normally do. And when you either leave the patient or drop the patient at the patient at the hospital, that's when it's done or when we um, end the scenario. Uh, and actually one of the most important decisions that uh, an ambulance nurse has to take is whether to finalize the treatment on site uh, or bring the patient to the hospital. And that particular decision point was not at all captured in the previous um, uh, ways that they had, tra had trained this. So that I think was a very uh, practical and useful uh, new piece of knowledge for them. Uh, the third project is uh, called Hidden in the Park. And this is about risk awareness and in particular about risk awareness is about uh, dangerous situations online or in social media and in especially grooming, which is um, um, an exceeding problem, it seems, in, in many parts of the world. So this was done with the partners uh, from a foundation called Change Attitude, which work against the sexual abuse of children and um, the word Childhood Foundation. Uh, and the problem we addressed here was to how to address sensitive topics in games. Um, so especially for the a topic like grooming, which is according to our partners in the project and the police, even a problem concerning kids as young as six or seven years old because already then they start to uh, be on different platforms where these things happen. So how do you address this in a serious game? Uh, maybe the answer to that is, well, not at all. Uh, so um, there is actually nothing disturbing or frightening uh, in the game, not in the visuals uh, or in the material of the game. Uh, but what there is, is a procedure. Uh, so we borrowed this uh, ideas from uh, game scholar Ian Bogost and his ideas of procedural rhetoric that the message can be in the procedure rather than in the theme of the game. Um, so the game itself is for four player. It's a board game combi combined with the AR. And the uh, game is about hiding a treasure. So each player hides uh, his or her own treasure. And then the game is about finding each other's treasures with the help of different clues that you can earn in different ways. So every player hides his uh, treasure uh, and it can be found by four clues uh, or the combination of four clues will reveal um, 
the, the treasure. So it's a bit like Cluedo. Um, you use the tablet for a variety of things. Uh, of course, it tells you what to do. You use the tablet to hide your treasure. Uh, you use the tablet and the AR function to guess where someone has hidden their treasure. And the winner is the one who first finds someone else's treasure. Um, and also with the, the uh, tablet, you get to play several uh, mini games of different sorts. So suddenly something happens. Uh, through the tablet, you get messages from an unknown participant who starts to ask you for clues uh, and tries to get you to reveal your clues with the help of different strategies. So that can be promises. If you give me a clue, I will do this and that for you. Uh, or bribes. If you give me a clue, you, I will uh, give you one extra play session uh, at the mini game you like the most or sometimes even threats that if you don't do this, I will reveal uh, one of the clues to your treasure to the other players. So the unique thing about those uh, procedures that the things that this hidden player enacts is that they are all developed uh, based on patterns of how these perpetrators act when they are online. So it's exactly those uh, patterns that were identified from uh, um, several thousand pages of uh, transcripts of grooming processes from, um, uh, from court cases in Sweden. Uh, and then the thing is that these patterns, these things are then the foundation for the teaching manual. So the game comes with a manual that tells you how you as a teacher can work with and discuss those situations. How can you recognize them? How can you see when these patterns occur? So the learning is in that the procedures are in the game, but the uh, transfer to other situations and uh, the discussion of the sensitive parts of the topic is all with the teacher. So apart from inspiration from procedural rhetoric, uh, we also looked at uh, the work of a game designer called Brenda Romero. She has a vision where she says that the mechanic is the message. Uh, that is what you do in the game has some meaning. And uh, she has a very famous example in her train game, which is a roll and dice games and you select actions to pack and transport the pawns of the game as effectively and efficient as possible. And then after some time, it turns out that you're actually loading and transporting prisoners to a concentration camp. And then of course, the whole game changes uh, and creates awareness of something completely different that was uh, uh, not at all uh, uh, on the board from the beginning. So that was also a source of inspiration, I think. Um, so we learned that the, it worked well with the tests with the teachers. Uh, we, the AR thing uh, was actually quite nice as a wow factor, but uh, who knows how long AR is a wow factor? Probably not for long. And that, that is, I guess, the problem with trusting the wow factor too much in serious games that they will grow old very quickly. Um, but the using the 
context and the teacher as a resource uh, for a serious purpose and the teacher manual is a key factor for that that proved uh, to be a, a good way a successful way um, of doing that uh, in this context uh, we really learned that it's very important to put the game into some kind of context to create the meaning and discussion and interpretation of these mechanics and procedures with the kids. And uh, we, we utilize that strategy with the teachers then. Uh, so, I think that the three cases can be summarized like this, that you have utility axis and you have a gameplay axis. Um, and that somehow it should be a sort of balance between gameplay and utility. Uh, what we found typically when we meet with clients and participants and co-workers from different areas is that they very much worry about, and of course they do, about utility, uh, which can be interpreted as in this pay, uh, well, not a game. They're not really into that part of it. Um, whereas the other dimension, the gameplay experience, typically resides completely on the uh, development team then. Uh, or if there is uh, an optimal solution to this, dilemma. Uh, so if we look at the different projects on this space, I'd say that the Sorek game, well, it's almost all about utility. Uh, we did not really do much game design there. I think that uh, the enhancement of the approach to role playing and that the scenarios were perceived as more vivid and interesting. That was the gameplay experience. I think that we managed to increase the level of their gameplay by introducing this contextualization and by taking the instructor out of the actual scenario enactment. Uh, hidden in the park sort of resides on the other end, uh, a high focus on designing an attractive game, um, uh, but where context is everything to provide the support for how to use it when addressing the topic. And the Eleanor possibly in the middle, uh, where we somehow struck a pretty good combination of the two. Uh, but according to our experience from these and several other projects, this is um, likely to be very hard and very costly. Uh, so probably it's better to aim for some of the other combinations rather than this one at the upper right corner with high gameplay experience and high utilities. Yeah, hard. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think that I will um, close my talk somewhere here saying that we summarize this in a couple of principles where some of them are rooted in several projects and where some are really strong in particular projects. Uh, and these are the materials uh, that I have used. Um, and if you want to read particularly about the, oh, uh, sorry, particularly about the uh, design principles, uh, they are summarized in uh, this paper, the fourth reference by uh, Henrik Engström and myself. And then some other pointers to materials and inspirations um, 
as well as our own papers and reports where you can get more of the details if you're interested in, in those details. So with that, I think, thank you for your attention. So with that, I want to thank Professor Buckland very much for an interesting and stimulating talk and come back next week for the next talk. Thank you, Per. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.